I'm Stefan Hell. In the coming lecture, I'm going to explain the principles of super-resolution fluorescence microscopy with emphasis on stat microscopy. Now, we've all been told that the resolution of a light-focusing microscope is fundamentally limited by diffraction to about 200 nanometers. So if you're having features residing at a closer distance than 200 nanometers, half the wavelengths of light, it's not really possible to tell them apart. Now, this is the reason why electron microscopy was invented, and there's no doubt about the fact that as a result of its higher spatial resolution, electron microscopy has allowed us to make many discoveries. However, it's also clear that if you want to look inside a cell in three dimensions, especially inside a living cell or even living tissues in three dimensions, there is no alternative to using focused visible light. Now, for that reason, of course, a light microscope that would overcome the diffraction barrier an image with a spatial resolution of an electron microscope would be very, very important, especially for the life sciences, but not only for the life sciences. Now, why have people thought that the resolution of a light focusing microscope has come to an end? The reason for that can be put in very simple words. The main part of a light microscope is the objective lens. And the role of this objective lens is to focus the light down to a point. But because light propagates as a wave, it's not possible for the lens to concentrate all the light into a single point. Rather, the light will be smeared out, forming a blob that is at least about 200 nanometers across the focal plane. And as a result, all the features falling within that spot will be flooded at the same time with light. In fluorescence microscopy, it will be excitation light. And hence, of course, all the features will give off signal, will be collected by the lens, and it's not possible to tell these features apart. Now, the person who has realized this diffraction resolution barrier, Ernst Abbe, formulated this problem in an equation. Two features of the same kind, in order to be separated by a light microscope, have to be a further away than the distance d, given by the wavelengths of light, divided by twice the so-called numerical aperture of the objective lens. And this value amounts to at least about 200 nanometers up to 300, 400, 500 nanometers. And this is the reason why people have thought that a light microscope will not be able to do any better than that. Now, in order to explain to you how we can overcome this diffraction barrier, let's have a look again at the problem of focusing. Now, as I said, the lens will not be able to make a smaller spot than that. If it could make a smaller spot, of course, we could concentrate the light in here and in here, and we could dis 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 uh, discern, of course, the features that are here at a very close distance. But this is not possible. All the molecules that reside within this 200 nanometer zone would be flooded at the same time with excitation light, hence give off fluorescence at the same time. So this is the energy diagram of a flow for excitation, fluorescence, and hence the signal that is generated in here more or less at the same time, will be confounded by any detector, and separation is not possible. Now, it's rather clear, I would say, that the diffraction problem basically persists only within this typical range. If we manage to sort out the features, separate, for example, this strand from that strand, let's assume these are marker tubules, then, of course, the rest, separating the rest here in the object would be trivial. So it's fully OK to just to concentrate on this critical 200 nanometer zone. Once we've sorted out the problem in here and managed to separate the features in here, we are truly done. So let's concentrate just on this zone and ask, how can we tell the features in here apart? Now, if the problem really is that all the features are flooded at the same time with excitation light and hence give off light at the same time, a solution to the problem is to make sure that not all the features that are flooded, inevitably flooded with excitation light, are in the end capable of emitting. And this is exactly what we do in a STAT microscope. In a STAT microscope, we not only use a beam for exciting molecules, so the one that is focused into this 200 nanometer range, but we also, also use a beam of light that is typically shaped as a donut. And the role of this beam is to keep the molecules dark, turn them off, if you will. So, how can we do that? How can a beam of light keep molecules dark, keep molecules off? Well, in fluorescence microscopy or in a fluorescent molecule, this is possible by using photons that 
don't have an energy that is high enough to excite molecules, but have much lower energy. And if the photon energy fits the fluorescent state, the gap, energy gap between the fluorescent state and the ground state, those photons, of course, are capable of sending molecules back down to the ground state instantly by taking away the majority of, of the energy um, in, um, in this uh, uh, redshifted beam. So the beam here is redshifted because this is low, uh, lower photon energy, and the role of the beam is just to silence the molecules. How can we make sure that the molecules remain silent? Well, first of all, as I explained, you have to use the right wavelengths, but that's not all. You also have to make sure that there is enough red photons in the, in the red-shifted beam. And why? Because if there is enough red photons, we can be sure that once the molecule gets excited, there's always a red photon out there that will instantly kick the molecule down to the ground state. And this is actually shown here in this view graph. Here, we have plotted the probability of a molecule to be on or to be fluorescent as a function of the intensity of the red beam. And you see that typically, after a certain threshold, this threshold intensity IS, the molecule is not capable of emitting anymore because there's always a red photon, so to speak, in the air that would kick the molecule down to the ground state and hence shut off the ability of the molecule to reside here in the fluorescent state. So those molecules in here cannot assume the fluorescent state. They have to reside, in essence, in the ground state. They have to stay dark. So you've seen that we have um, shaped the stat beam into a donut pattern. Why that? Because we don't want to shut off all the molecules. We want to see some molecules. We want to discern features, like we want to discern this microtubule from that microtubule. So you want to keep an area where the molecules are still capable of emitting. Now this area is the area in which the intensity of the donut is smaller than the threshold intensity IS. So here, the molecules are still allowed to emit, despite the fact that all of them are covered with excitation light. Only these are allowed to emit. The rest is silenced. This is the basic principle of stat microscopy. Only a subset of molecules is capable of emitting within this 200 nanometer zone, namely a subset that is located at a specific location in space that is predetermined by the yeah, shape, by the pattern of the stat beam. OK. Now, the question is, um, once we have a signal from here, generated signal, we just have one intensity signal, but we want to see also the, the rest of the features. What do we do? Well, the simple answer is we move the beam across the 200 nanometer zone. And now, these two molecules are allowed to emit. Of course, we can't separate them because they produce signal at the same time, but they can clearly be separated from the molecules of this strand. Why? Because these ones emit when these ones are off, and so we can separate them because they are forced to emit sequentially in time. We always know where the signal comes from because the coordinates of emission is preset by the red beam, by the position of this minimum of intensity of the red beam of the donut. And so we scan that beam across the 200 nanometer zone and, and so to speak, generate a signal from very tiny regions and so can separate these features, um, although they are very close together. Now, the strengths of such a concept as that microscopy that determines with the beam of light where the molecules are allowed to emit and where, they, where they're not allowed to emit is that you can tune the spatial resolution just by tuning the spatial extent in which emission is possible. For example, here, we have made a larger area in which emission is possible. How can this be done? Well, the intensity of this donut beam is now slightly weaker, and so uh, this area in which it is too weak and beyond or below the threshold is, has now become larger. The resolution is not so good. So now the resolution is higher, and you can make, in principle, even very high, for example, such that only one molecule fits into this very tiny little area, so in principle down to the size of a molecule. If you get a few photons from here, we already know where it is, and we know that there is a molecule, we can have very high spatial resolution in principle. And we can, of course, separate this molecule from the adjacent molecule just by moving that little uh, donut beam such that adjacent molecules are capable of emitting only sequentially in time and not simultaneously, and this gives us the separation. So in any case, if you do it like that, so defining with the beam of light where the molecules are allowed to emit and where the molecules are not allowed to emit, in that case, 
the resolution cannot be given by Abbe's equation anymore like this expression. We have to use a modified expression, which is actually shown in here. And in this modified expression, this threshold intensity, Is, will have a critical role. You see it in here. Moreover, the brightness of the beam, the total brightness of the beam, will also have a critical role because the larger it is, this intensity I, the higher the resolution we get because the D will become very small. And now you see in this expression, we have here this ratio I over Is. If it becomes very large, D becomes very small, and hence the resolution, of course, very, very large. And so we can tune the spatial resolution. And as I said, the rest of the sample, the rest of the features in the 200 nanometer zone is simply obtained by scanning the beam further. We always know where the signal comes from because the position of the on state, of the emissive state, is determined by the beam that we put on the sample, so by the photons that go into the sample. And so we can separate features and disentangle the features within this critical 200 nanometer zone. Okay, so once we have done our job within that 200 nanometer zone, we are done for that region, so what happens with the rest? One option is, of course, to move further with the beam and to go like that, like that, like that, and do the rest of the on-off game, so to speak, also on the rest of the sample. Of course, one could imagine also having many donuts or for stripes, like structured illumination and so on, but the simplest way of doing it is, of course, to just move that excitation and co-aligned stat beam across the specimen. And if you wonder how this is done technically, I'm just showing you a little view graph. Here you see a typical arrangement of a stat microscope. This is the objective lens, and of course we have here the excitation beam producing green light that is focused into this, into this area, obviously, but it's overlaid with the red beam that turns the molecules off. And in order to produce a donut, um, or in order to render a donut, the red beam passes a little piece of glass that has a varying thickness. And this variation in thickness produces this donut shape. So it's technically relatively simple to produce donuts, but the net result is that for a certain intensity, only molecules residing in this small region are in the end capable of emitting, because in this area here, where the molecules are shown in dark color, they are not allowed to assume the fluorescent state, and hence they are switched off. You could flood them with excitation light, but they would stay off. And this concept, of course, has led to higher spatial resolution. On the left-hand side, you see a confocal recording uh, of individualized molecules on the surface. Now, on the right-hand side, you see the same recording or the same uh, sample recorded now with stat microscopy. Here, we can clearly separate the molecules. Why? At the time this one was emitting, this one was turned off. And at the time this one was emitting, this one was turned off. Here, on the contrary, the molecules were allowed to emit simultaneously, and this is why we could not separate them. Now, this on-off switching, for example, by exciting to turn the fluorescence on or de-exciting to turn the fluorescence off, is done just by using basic molecular transitions of a dye. Excitation and de-excitation by stimulated emission are very fundamental, very basic phenomena that are encountered basically in any fluorophore. Now, uh, I would like to show another imaging application. Now, confocal microscopy has been the gold standard for at least 20 years, um, I would, should say at the end of the 20th century. It provided the best possible spatial resolution in fluorescence microscopy. But again, you see, here the confocal microscope is not able to discern the yeah, units of the nuclear pore complex indicated in here. So, because the spatial resolution is about 250 nanometers, now we do a stat recording. And this really tells a different story. Because the resolution is fundamentally increased, as you see in here, the stat microscope is capable of discerning the eight individual subunits here of the nuclear pore complex. Why? Because the spatial resolution is improved by an order of magnitude. It's roughly about 25 nanometers in this case. So we see eight individual subunits, but confocal microscopy couldn't tell the difference. No way to see it with confocal microscopy. So an order of magnitude of resolution increase really means something. Now, keep in mind, the stat recording is done like any, say, confocal recording. You place the sample, you push a button, the beams move across the specimen, scanning over the sample, 
and out comes the image. There's no further requirement on image processing or anything, just the preparation of the beams of light with regard to the transitions of the flow for, in the end, render the image. And this is the strength of this concept. Everything is done, basically, by molecular transitions. Now, I would like to show you a few applications. So um, here's that microscopy has been used in order to um, uh, unravel this, uh, the spatial arrangement of proteins um, in the presynaptic, uh, presynaptic active zone in Drosophila neuromuscular junction. So a certain protein called Brophilot and another protein, a rim-binding protein, are arranged in space. They cannot be resolved because the resolution is not good enough in the confocal case, but here in um, in that microscopy, the resolution is good. Um, it's of the order of 30 to 40 nanometers, and so one could instantly get an idea of how these um, uh, proteins are arranged in space. You see here distances of 38, 57, 98 nanometers uh, between uh, different terminal ends of the proteins. And so uh, this helps coming up with a model of the um, um, of the presynaptic active zone of the proteins involved there. Now, another application, neurophysiology. So this is a stretch of a dendrite in a um, hippocampal organotypical slice, a living hippocampal organotypical slice. So um, some of the dendrites here, some of the neurons here, express the yellow fluorescent proteins. This is why we can see them. And what you see here is now den dendritic spines with a spatial resolution that is about three to four times better than in a, a standard confocal or multi-photon a microscope. And you can see, of course, the dynamics. You can see how they change over time. For example, here, if you concentrate on this, on this little spine, we can see how this little spine actually evolves in time, forming this little cup uh, in the end. And so this is quite interesting because one can learn about the morphological changes that go on in neurons. And of course, morphology is connected with, morphology is connected with function. This is very well known. A strength of a STAT concept is that it can be neatly integrated with a confocal microscope. So you can use that in order to improve the resolution of confocal microscopy very easily. And that means that one can image deeper down into specimen, and this is demonstrated here, like 10 microns deep, 63 nanometers, 25 microns deep, 65 microns deep, 115 microns deep, and still the high spatial resolution um, is fully maintained. And um, uh, probably in the future we'll be able to go even deeper down with some special uh, optics, but the point that I'm making here is that you can focus, of course, into deeper regions of, um, of uh, uh, neuronal tissue in this case, and have, still have the high spatial resolution in a living um, uh, neuronal tissue. Now, quite exciting is the fact that you can even focus into the brain tissue of a living mouse. So and, uh, here, actually, a mouse was anesthetized, and the skull was opened, and a cover slip was placed on top of it, and we focused the light onto the molecular layer of the somatosensory cortex, doing that on a transgenic mouse that expressed, in some of its neurons, the yellow fluorescent protein. And now you see, again, the stretch of a dendrite, and this is a sequential recording, so in other words, a movie, and what can be seen in here is actually how these little dendrites change over time, how they, they change the morphology and um, during, during um, yeah, anesthesia. And actually, the mouse was living, so it's during the process of life, if you will. It's interesting to focus here on this, on this uh, small little area. It's possible to see, again, how this, this subtle changes, this morphological changes going on in the, in the brain of the living mouse. So this tells us that subdiffraction resolution imaging by STAT really has the potential to open up uh, a totally new avenue for, investing, for investigating brain. For example, seeing proteins in here um, on the synapse and so on. Now, after this, say, showing a few examples of applications, I'm coming back to the basic principle. Well, in STAT microscopy, we separate by making sure that adjacent features are not capable of emitting at the same time, because this one is off when this one is on and vice versa, and we do that by applying a beam of light that determines where the features are on and where the features are off. 
Now, this principle is, of course, a very fundamental principle because there are several ways of playing the on-off game, so to speak, because there are several molecular mechanisms that are imaginable for, for separating features like that by on-off. Now, STAT um, was the first method probably because um, if you, well, if you have at least a physics background, then you know that the most fundamental way of turning off a flow for is to send the molecule from the first state down to the ground state. There's nothing more fundamental than that. You just send it back to the ground state and you silence the fluorescence. Because of that, the concept of stat microscopy is, is very universal. You can apply it basically to any flow form. But this universality um, comes at a price that we have to pay. In order to switch off a floor for, or turn off a floor for, by this phenomenon of stimulated emission by a beam of light, the exciting molecules, you have to make sure that the beam is bright enough because we have to have, say, many photons, red-shifted photons in the air, so to speak, ready to shift, the, to shift the molecule down to a ground state in the case it gets excited. We have only one nanosecond of time, so you have to make sure there's enough photons in the air, so to speak, to be ready to shift the molecule down to the ground state. And this is the reason why we have this megawatt per square centimeter. So, because this can be a drawback in a number of applications, especially if one goes to very short wavelengths and the very, very high intensities, the question comes up, are there alternative on-off mechanisms that allow us to play a stat like on-off switching, but at much lower light levels? And surely there are. And this is the idea behind this generalization of resolved microscopy. Now, in, in a typical, say, resolved microscope, which is in principle a stat-like microscope, um, we use not stimulated emission to off-switch molecules, so not at the excitation by light, but we use two states, metastable states of a floor for like a cis state and a trans state. Now, usually such states have a relatively long lifetime, like milliseconds to seconds. And because they have a long lifetime, this on-off, say, difference in states can be maintained for a longer period of time. And so there is not no much reason to hurry up and putting in many photons. So one can reduce, and this is very important, the intensity required to play the on-off game by, by orders of magnitude. And the same can be done, for example, by using reversibly switchable fluorescent proteins, because usually they also have um, cis-trans isomerization as a basic mechanism for going from an activatable state to a, a deactivated state and vice versa. So how do we play uh, a stat-like game here with cis-trans? Well, we use, for example, blue light, for example, that pushes the molecule from cis to trans. And as you can see here, what happens, we push cis to trans, all the molecules are turned off, are in, are in the trans, but only these are in the cis. And so we flood everything with excitation light. No way out. All the molecules will be covered. But only these are allowed to emit because they are in the cis. The rest is in the trans, so they can't emit. And so we can separate this feature from that, of course, by doing the same thing with the rest of the molecules. Now, the good thing is, as I said, the IS, the threshold, is reduced by orders of magnitude. And this equation, of course, means that D can become very small, even if the intensity I is not so high is reduced by orders of magnitude. So can we play this game? The answer is yes. We can play this game. How do we do that? Well, we turn off molecules like deactivate for the switchable molecules like switchable fluorescent proteins, and then read out those that have been left over. But then we have to activate them again. So we turn them on again. And then again, we turn them off, read out those, activate everything again. We have to activate everything because the beam with which we activate is also limited by diffraction. So all the molecules will be activated, and then we turn off again, and then these are left over, and we can discern the features like in the stat microscope. But now, as you can certainly imagine, if you play this on-off game, like switching on, uh, switching off, reading out this fluorescence, um, we have to force the molecule to go between the on-off state many times. There is, there is no way out. Because we inevitably activate all the molecules lying within the 2 nanometer zone, so many of the molecules will go on and off without having been read out. So there will be many on-off cycles required in order to play the on-off game. So this concept resolved has become powerful um, recently because new for the switchable fluorescent proteins were become, became available that allow us to accommodate many 
on-off cycles, like the ones that are described here in this literature. And so you can see that we can have here a higher spatial resolution, a stat-like resolution, although there is no stat in it. It's all done by, uh, in this case, a sister isomerization. This has allowed us to do a stat-like recording at orders of magnitude lower light levels. Now, by this, I don't mean that it's going to replace that entirely. Of course, STAT maintains a number of advantages, such as it allows you to stop the fluorescence instantly. Here, you always have a kinetics, of course, between the on and the off state. But still, when it comes to imaging very gently, resolved, so this, this method clearly has an advantage. Why? Because you can have a STAT-like recording at very, very low light levels. In fact, here we have recorded neuronal tissue at very, very low light levels over an extended period of time. So it's a living neuron hip hippocampal organ, typical slice. And uh, after two hours of recording, there was no visible photodegradation. And this is really remarkable because it means that one can uh, break a diffraction barrier, stay under physiological condition, even work at very low light levels because we take advantage of the uh, long lifetime of the two on-off states involved. Now, how do these concepts, the stat resolved, um, compare with palm storm? Now, especially since resolved and palm storm both use, say, for the switchable fluorescent proteins. Now, in the stat and in the resolved case, it's very important to understand we determine with a beam of light where the molecules are on and where they're off. So we use the blue beam of light to turn, for example, the proteins off in here and you see they're allowed to be on only in here, or with the red beam of light in, in the case of STAT. And so we use a pattern of light to define the coordinates with very high precision in space uh, where the molecules are capable of emitting light. So this is a hallmark of it. We don't have to find out where the emission takes place. We know already where it is because we have used this pattern of light to determine where the emission comes from, or has to come from, to be precise. Now in Palmstone, this is different. No structured illumination, no donut or stripe or anything is used in here. So molecules are turned from the off state to an on state randomly with uniform illumination, such that only one molecule fits into this 200 nanometer zone. Of course, if this happens randomly at any location within the 200 nanometer zone, we have no clue where it's located. But we can find it out, and that's the good news here. If the molecule is capable of emitting m photons in a bunch, so many photons in a bunch, because then we can locate with very high precision where the molecule has gone to the, m, uh, to the on state. And so we can locate with very high precision. We know with very high precision where, where the molecule is located. And then we make a tick mark in here in the palm storm case, turn it off, this is important, and go to the next. And turn, it, turn this one off, locate it, and go to the next randomly. And this is how we can separate things again. All the molecules here flooded with excitation light, no way out. But only this one is allowed to emit. And this is why we can separate, of course, this feature from the other feature, because the molecules are allowed to emit only sequentially uh, from adjacent features. Again, here, everything is flooded with excitation light, but only this one is allowed to emit. And this is why we can separate these features from that feature. And so we go on and reconstruct this is why it's also called storm, stochastic optical reconstruction, microscopy, uh, the whole 209 meters of molecule by molecule at random positions in space. Now, a good question is, how do the two concepts compare? What are the requirements for each of them? For example, in terms of fluorophores, some fluorophores will be good for this one, but not so good for that one, and vice versa. So what are the conditions, actually, uh, uh, for, for this one or for that one in terms of the fluorophores? Now, it's very clear that a method such as palm storm requires many fluorescence emission cycles, so many photons to be emitted, because we need those photons to locate where we are. Here, the positioning, the precise positioning is done with the photons that come out. Here, this is not the case, because here we use uh, the beam of light, which has many photons inherently, to determine with very high precision where the molecules are on and where they're off. So, so here we determine the position, the coordinate of emission, with the photons that go in, that come in from the laser. Here we do it with the photons that come out from the sample. And of course, there are many photons here that go in. And of course, there must be many photons that come out, because otherwise we don't get the precision. But then, um, 
Whereas this sounds like a disadvantage, this one has a big advantage, palm storm in this case. It's enough to have the molecules go only once from off to on and back to off to record an image. That's enough. Because once you have recorded the molecule, you go to the next and you don't have to return to that molecule. So one switching cycle is enough. This is not the case in here. Here, of course, a few emission cycles are, fluorescence emission cycles are okay. If two, three, four photons come out of these, say, many molecules, we know that there is a strand, a microtube or whatever, we can go on. But we need many on-off cycles in order to make an image. So if the molecule uh, basically dies simply because not able to accommodate many on-off cycles, we have a problem in here. So you see there is a complementarity in the way it works and also in, in, the, in, its, in its requirements for, um, uh, for, for getting an image using uh, fluorophores. And some fluorophores will be better at this, slum fluorophores will be better at that. Now, if you ask me, since I'm talking about this family of concepts, what, what is the kind of unique strengths of this concept? Well, as I said, you don't need many photons to, to know that there is something because we know already the position of emission because we predetermined it with the photons from the laser. And because of that, and because this takes time, of course, to get all those photons and works on a single molecule level, you can imagine that this one is quite good at making fast images. And this is actually what is illustrated here. You see on, on the left-hand side, you see basically uh, the stat-like recording. On the right-hand side, you see uh, the palm storm uh, right recording. Now, if the sample moves, obviously, uh, in the stochastic method in palm storm, you can imagine that, um, uh, that the whole recording time starts from the first to the last molecule. And if something moves, of course, uh, the pattern will be smeared out because the temporal difference between two adjacent features can be very large. It can be as long as the typical duration of the whole recording. But in a deterministic case where we preset the coordinate, like, like in, a, um, in, in, in the stat case, uh, the situation is different. Adjacent features are recorded at very small time intervals. And because they're recorded at very small time intervals, the movement doesn't matter that much for the separation. And this is why we can still record in a stat microscope and see, say, uh, features uh, separately. Whereas in the other case, in the, in the uh, palm storm case, there will be more or less a blur. So this is a, an important point. Now, this is actually the reason why it has been easier with stat microscopy to get very high speed sub resolution imaging, super resolution images. And I would like to show you an um, uh, early example here. This is a snapshot of um, uh, moving uh, synaptic vesicles in the living hippocampal neuron. And as you can see, um, uh, the confocal resolution cannot resolve it, but in this case, that has allowed us to see the movement of the synaptic vesicles so you can go past the diffraction barrier and at the same time be fast. Why? Because we know already where the signal comes from. A few photons are enough to know that there is a vesicle. And uh, this is the, the, the inherent physical conceptual reason why um, STAT allows you to, to do fast imaging and, of course, 3D recording of moving samples. Now, um, finally, I'm addressing the question, we are now able to take images, but maybe 20 years back, we couldn't take these images. So what is the reason, what is the key point behind the recording of these features? Um, clearly, it's not a fact that we localize molecules with high precision because the localization just gives you the coordinate. It doesn't give you the separation, and the separation is critical. Without separation, we cannot see features. We can take images because we have other molecules around, around in here. So if there's just one molecule, literally, we couldn't take images. We could locate it, but we could not take images. So. Um, the point is, as you can imagine, that we transiently prepare the molecules in two different states. So while we, it, all, we flood, of course, all the features residing within the 200 nanometer zone um, at the same time with excitation light, only one molecule uh, in this case is allowed to emit, whereas only the small subset of molecules, if there are any, are allowed to emit. And this is what tell, allows us to tell the features apart. So, transitly bringing the molecules into an in on state and having the rest in an off state or vice versa allows us to overcome the diffraction barrier. Here, the coordinate of emission is predetermined. Here, it has to be found out. Both is very high precision, but the separation is done by the on-off, and that's a critical element. So 
Off means there is some mechanism in there that doesn't allow fluor uh, fluorescence to come out, although all the molecules are covered with excitation light, and this gives us the separation. Now, on and off is, of course, represented by states, A and B. And if you think about that, A is an emissive state, B is a non-emissive state, it becomes obvious that it's not fundamentally limited to fluorescence imaging. You can imagine all kind of, say, states, different states, A and B. It could be, for example, uh, fluorescent, non-fluorescent, as we've shown here, or it could also be absorbing, non-absorbing, cis, trans, green, blue, um, heating, not heating. One can imagine scattering, non-scattering. One can imagine many, many things. And this is why this concept is just at the beginning. Super-resolution microscopy, as I believe, is still at the beginning. It will evolve into a large field because so many on-off states or AB states are imaginable to, to overcome the diffraction resolution barrier. With that, I'm, of course, acknowledging and highlighting the people who have, who have contributed to this uh, the, uh, development. And finally, I'm coming to my very, very last slide. Iris equation, of course, cannot explain the entire situation because um, now we are able to do better than the gold standard of confocal microscopy. STAT, raw data in here, um, resolves much better than the confocal microscope, which has been the limit for many, for many, many years. And so the question comes, what do we do with this equation? Well, we've seen it already. We can easily expand it by plugging in the square root factor. And now it's worthwhile spending um, uh, a few thoughts on this equation. Of course, the resolution scales with the wavelengths. It still scales with the wavelengths, and it must scale with the wavelengths because we use diffracted beams, and every beam is still diffracted. We do nothing about diffraction. But it's not limited by diffraction. The resolution is not limited by the, by, by the wavelengths anymore. Why? Because we have this factor in here, and if this number becomes very large, this value of d can become very small. So although diffraction is maintained, the barrier set by diffraction is overcome. And that is the point. And how is it overcome in the end? I think it, it's very clear by now. Why can we separate, for example, this fiber from that fiber? The answer is very simple. At the time, the molecules of this fiber emitted light. These ones were dark. At the time, these ones emitted light. They were, these, ones, um, these ones were dark. So they were in two different states. So we resolve in modern super-resolution microscopy, not by making the light beams narrower or, or finer or something, or more focused, but by transiently placing the molecules that we look at in two different states. Placing the molecules transiently in two different states has allowed us to, to crack the diffraction resolution barrier fundamentally. Thank you very much.